Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I am um, very pleased to um, introduce Dr. Lucas Major to um, the School of Health Information Science seminar series. Uh, Dr. Major earned his BS, MS, and PhD in Industrial and Management Engineering from the University of Montana. He is an associate professor and a director of the Healthcare Engineering Department at the Radio Radiation Oncology Department of the UNC School of Medicine. He also holds a joint appointment in the School of Information and Library Science. Uh, he teaches classes and advises students on their projects and research. His research interests include engineering management as it pertains to continuous quality improvement and patient safety in healthcare and human factors engineering with a focus on workload and individual performance during human and machine interactions. His most recent research interests include application of data science methods and tools to AI, machine learning, natural language processing to augment medical decision making and quality assurance processes. While at the uh, North Carolina State University, Lucas was awarded the prestigious Alumni Outstanding Extension Service Award for his outreach work to the healthcare industry highlighting his passion for patient safety and operational improvements. Uh, he has published over uh, 50 papers as well as over 100 uh, conference proceedings and book chapters. And he's also written a book. So this is uh, really wonderful to have you here. And I'm um, excited about uh, your lecture today. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you so much for, uh, for having me. It's, it's truly an honor uh, to present this work. As I, uh, I have to say right away that I'm uh, most uh, a, a follower and you know admirer of the work of Elizabeth and, and Andrew and we are currently running a number of projects using some of uh, of your work so uh, uh, a lot of this coming together was inspired by uh, by you know your work so I'm really uh, really delighted to be here and thank you thank you for having me so what I want to what I want to do today is really talk about you know the research we've been uh, conducting uh, here at uh, UNC with kind of this bigger vision of you know how do we really go for towards this higher reliability in healthcare uh, and as you know as i as in my introduction i've been doing uh, healthcare work for the last you know 17 almost 20 years uh, really all my degree work uh, my phd work everything was been always in healthcare i kind of chose that profession very early that I really liked. I was studying manufacturing as an industrial engineer, but I had some internships early in my career, and I kind of decided that healthcare is going to be my um, kind of my thing. So, so with this, you know, I'm really passionate about this about this topic. So hopefully, I can uh, give you guys some um, uh, a, a nice uh, world, you know, value added uh, 45 minutes of of, of my presentation. Uh, it's a little bit of a conflict of interest. I, I do have uh, equity in a company that's called uh, Communify Health. Uh, it's a company that got started here at UNC and kind of you know went uh, and developed some software for quality improvement and so on. I'm not uh, actually presenting any of that work today, but just want to make sure that you guys are aware of that. Um, and also some uh, a lot of the funding uh, uh, results that I will be presenting presenting are coming from the funding that we got from AHRQ. And also from the university internally, we received some innovation awards, some grants, some service agreements. Uh, so that's how uh, we were able to uh, to fund this this work. All right. So I want to start uh, just on the slide. What you see is uh, my two boys, Sebastian, the older one, and Alexander, fourteen and eight. Um, and at the bottom of the slide, you can see our campus here and a picture of an airplane. Um, you know, and I kind of my, you know, when I get up in the morning and I think to myself, you know, why, you know, why I work and why I'm, you know, so passionate about what I do um, is to look at these two guys. And I sometimes would like to think that when I put them on a plane, I feel comfortable, right? They, we fly around the world and we kind of go and see families and visit places. And we do that. And I would like to feel the same way when I, when they go visit, you know, our, our hospitals. I would like to have the same confidence that you know that's what that's nothing's going to bet is going to happen to them. Um, so that's part, you know, that's in a large sense a, a lot of my motivation to what I do, and how I want to contribute to our healthcare system, and get up in the morning and be passionate and also you know be critical and then stand up and say this is how I see it and this is how we should be doing the things. So again, I I, I kind of I'm on the both spectrum. I do research, but I engage very heavily with our healthcare system to help them. Uh, you know, transition, you know, towards that high reliability. And I'll talk about it more uh, today. Um, I also have this uh, graphic uh, because I do want to set the stage in my presentation that a lot of times, you know, I do feel like I'm that little guy 
uh, you know, trying to fight this uh, this monster here. Um, because when it comes to healthcare, we know that the front seat, unfortunately, take a lot of organization like the CMS or the Leapfrogs and Joint Commission. They're all great. I have nothing against them, but they bring us this set of metric that they measure us uh, heavily on. And this is how we kind of get our reputation and our scores and our payments. But they, they not necessarily connect to the frontline people and they don't connect to the way we, we as engineers would like to do the work. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, are burned out and they are tired of these measurement systems that are being brought to them on a daily basis and really not connecting to the hearts of people to develop better systems, better tools, visualization, thinking about usability and other aspects. So, you know, just using this that, yes, this is an uphill battle, uh, but I guess, you know, I'm happy to fight it, you know, as long as I can. So um, just as we as we as we get started. So I will talk, uh, I'll give a little bit of background to set the stage about how I think about high, high reliability. Then I'm going to go through a, a set of research studies that we've conducted, you know, to kind of get there, to start kind of thinking about what we can do in radiation oncology. I will also speak to some efforts more broadly at our UNC Health uh, Systems, and I'll close with a couple uh, remarks. Um, so just get us uh, situated here. Um, so we are inspired in a large sense that there are industries that have done so well and they've shown for the prolonged time that we can run without major accidents. Uh, you know, so in the picture you see a nu nuclear aircraft carrier and it's uh, outstanding you know, to think about. There's uh, 6,000 men and women, right? A lot of them, you know, just kind of a high school degree. So, you know, with, with high school degrees, uh, this is a 24 story tall building if you think about it, right? It's a very complex uh, undertaking, you know, 2000 funds, you know, Technical manuals, if you stack them up, they would be at the height of the Washington Memo uh, Memorial. I mean, that is, that is, you know, that is truly kind of speaks to this, you know, complexity they deal with. Um, so the research was originated and they kind of learned a lot. But if we really think about healthcare, I want to kind of point you to this graphic that I have on the bottom right corner. And if you think about on the on the x-axis, I'm presenting that there's a system, there's a level of the interaction, right? And this is really coming from from Perot's normal accident theory uh, work. If you look at this interactive complexity, right? Uh, kind of more linear system and more, and more complex. And on the y-axis, you look, think about the loose versus tight coupling, the high reliability knowledge and the system design in the first place comes from the top, uh, top right corner, right? That I marked with the red box on the slide. Um, and that is very specific because as you probably know, you know, a lot of system designs and quality improvement and what we've set up in healthcare systems uh, comes from, you know, manufacturing systems. You know, we talk about Lean and Six Sigma and Toyotas and all these, right? But please notice that this is at the different level of, of what we do. If there are, these systems are much more linear. There's more time to actually catch the errors and correct the errors. And the coupling is much slower. Um, so I'm pointing this out up here. I'm going to come back to this concept as I as I keep talking, you know, through my through my work. But I want you to keep that in mind. That you know, my argument is that we need to kind of start thinking from a system perspective about how to properly design certain systems in healthcare and how we as an engineers can contribute with the methodology and the you know approach and how we kind of actually get uh, get to that point. All right, so. Uh, so what I want to, you know, so this slide here is uh, kind of uh, showing, uh, we wrote uh, with, my, with my chairman, you know, when I joined radiation oncology in about 2009, I came into the department uh, as an engineer and I uh, was asked, you know, can, can you help us improve our culture? And can you, can you build us a system that will take us to this next level of reliability? Um, so I'm going to show you some results. The department was in a quite distress. Uh, you know, this was a top down type of a leadership style, uh, you know, it was a kind of that old school medicine where, you know, a set of physicians uh, that were leaders in the department, the chair, you know, they kind of had a little bit too much of a blame culture. If something went wrong, things were being solved kind of, you know, in the meetings and not really involving everybody in the process. Patients were not engaged. You know, things were really looked from a very specific perspective. And when Dr. Marx took over the department, he wanted to change that. So we started working extremely hard on a culture and we've done a number of initiatives 
uh, of building building kind of the learning organization, how we learn from 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 errors, how we improve. And we know, uh, as I shamelessly uh, pointed on the slide, you know, we wrote this book uh, that if someone uh, some of you are interested, you know, would definitely a, a quick read. But we describe the process uh, of going from uh, from that culture and actually as you can see on the slide in about 2015-16 really getting this culture to the next level these results are by the ahrq patient safety culture survey which is a national survey that we take and i think a lot of other organizations are, are taking and i'm pinpointing few of those um, few of those results but you can see that change and also what's important on the x-axis you can see the number in parentheses. You see the number of people that are willing to take the survey. And we have about 110 people in the department here in Chapel Hill. So you can see that not only we are improving the scores, but people are willing to even take the survey. And I think that's even a diff that's a very important indicator of, of, of changing culture. So as we're changing the culture, we're hoping for better results. So on the left bottom corner, you have a table with our rates of uh, different incidents, right? From severity one, where you know it does not reach the patient, but it was reported and we have a good reporting culture, you know, all the way to uh, uh, severity six, which would be you know, a death, you know, really a serious uh, event. And I want to pinpoint that I'm showing you results from about 2016, because when the, change, when the change of the culture kind of occurred, we start realizing that uh, we were able to run for five years to six years without this really severe incident. And as you can see, we were always, we were always, we were also able to, to reduce some of the severity too, from, you know, 1% to the half percent, as you can see, the threes, the fours, you know, they kind of vary. There's some reasons that I, you know, I would uh, be happy to kind of go later into, uh, into the discussion there. Um, but, you know, we, we can see that this is achievable when you start building the, from a systems perspective, and you're building all the components of the IT and usability and interactions and the, thinking about workload and kind of take our approach as engineers, you can achieve results that you can be possibly calling high reliability, which is not having major accidents for a prolonged period of time, right? I don't know exactly what, how many years it really takes to call yourself a high reliability system, but if it's five, if it's six, if that's a, if that's a beginning, uh, you know, we definitely were able to show some of that, uh, some of that, uh, those results. So I'm going to go to some studies, you know, what have we been, so what we've been doing, we really kind of broke down the system into components, um, you know, to think about it, you know, and this is a very high level here, but for some of you that are not maybe familiar with radiation oncology, uh, on the picture hey, there with the consultation, that's actually Dr. Marks right there. Um, and he's, uh, that's a consultation, right? We need to have a consultation with the patient and the family to understand the, the, the issues. And then really it goes through a very heavy planning process where we work very closely with our dosimetrists and, and, and physicians in an iterative way of be able to plan, uh, you know, plan what we want to deliver. Then it goes, uh, this plan goes through a very rigorous physics QA, quality assurance process, which we make sure that the machine can deliver the plan that has been designed. And eventually, as you can see, we go into the treatment, which depending on the fractionation and dose and everything else, it, uh, the patients come uh, and, and receive it, right? So those are, this is a very complex and, he and heavily you know, technology-based system. Um, in this case, in IMRT, you know, there, it clearly, even at the higher level, we can count 46 steps, you know, 15 handoffs, again, just to initiate this therapy. So again, a lot of, a lot of communication that happens uh, physically and then electronically, so potential for error tremendous, as you can as you can as you can imagine. Um, so uh, we built a lab. You know, this is our first lab. We just got a corner office of, of someone that uh, was not even an office; it was a storage room. And I said, "I'll take it. Uh, why not?" And we, uh, you know, as human factors engineers, we kind of got our equipment. You know, eye tracking, the videos, and all the all the computers and we really wanted to start really understanding all these interactions you know for all the different softwares that we were able to build so uh, we actually did okay and we are now in the possession of this type of a layout where we have a much larger space in radiation oncology next to machines so we are embedded into the department where we have a as you can see, office space there's a one-way mirror or window if you could if I can say so we can see the studies. Uh, we have a space where we can organize and simulate a lot of different uh, 
um, you know, run different simulations that we really believe are important to study and, and, uh, and be looked closely during our uh, usability work and system design works. So this laboratory is, is, is embedded in the department right now and allows us to really be aggressive on, on the improvement efforts that we are trying to, to take. Um, so I want to kind of start with few, few, few of these studies. You know, I'm going to take you guys back to well, you know a couple of years ago. This is 2013. So I do want to work through a little bit of history. Um, uh, when we started, we asked ourselves the first question: um, Let's look at the workload, um, and we use them, you know, very validated measure as you know NASA TLX, you know, one of those uh, bread and butter tools to to measure workload. Uh, so which you see on the x-axis, and on this experiment. On the y-axis, we were measuring a willingness to approve the plan where we where subjects came to our lab and they were asked to work on what we would call an easy, right? Like a palliative or post, you know, two field brain, fairly, you know, bread and butter, what even residents would start working on, versus a very difficult uh, kind of curative four-field post-operative uh, pancreas case. So uh, we came in, there were residents. And there were, uh, you know, attendings, and, and you can see the attendings are here marked with the the black series, uh, dots, and residents are in the uh, kind of open open circles here. And as you can see, what we've noticed in that first study is that yes, where where the workload was, uh, you know, below this mark of fifty five, right? So you see that red line. There was a pattern that people were willing to approve the plan, and you can see a lot of these open dots, meaning. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the reverse. Open dots were the physicians, I apologize, and the black dots were the residents. Um, so you can see attendings that have more experience working on these things. They were, they, it was the plan, it felt easier, right? They perceived the workload to be lower because of their experience and everything else. It was unlimited time, by the way, they had to complete it on this very specific time limit. Um, and we kind of noticed that, you know, a lot of these things that uh, people recognized that the workload was high. You know they were not willing to approve the plan, which was great. We felt like great that they are not willing to move forward. And but we started to study, you know, if there is that kind of relationship between, um, you know, workload and performance. I'll walk you through through this um, through the next set of studies. The next experiment we we asked ourselves is that what if we put people under the condition of of cross coverage, meaning you uh, you're going to come into the lab and we're going to say, hey, today certain physician you know called in sick. And you and it's uh, the patient is already at the you know waiting on you at the table. There are a couple of things we need to look over and make some changes according to the notes. Can you look at this plan very quickly and see what you know how you feel about it? So we we um, we've done the experiment saying that that would be one versus we would put it under condition that someone had a chance to 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 work through this case feeling that this patient is coming back. So they read the notes and this was much more familiar and we called it a regular coverage. And again, we are interested if we can quantify the difference on the workload using the NASA TLX with respect to these two things. And really interestingly speaking, again, I'm pointing to this 55 line because as a red line there, because what we were looking is that the only couple cases that had errors in this experiment were the cases that kind of went over the 55 on the workload. Those cases started to show that there were some errors that, uh, that, uh, that were performed. So we start kind of looking at some patterns. So then what we have done as a, as a next step, we kind of bundled this data together and we ask ourselves, you know, uh, can we actually see if there, is a, if there is some sort of relationship between the NASA TLX and the severity grade of these errors that we've seen in these experiments that we've been running. And as you can see, uh, we have. And then, um, you know, in this analysis, we are able to actually perform this, uh, this testing. And again, using kind of this, you know, dotted black line, really, I'm not talking that we, we found the red line, right? That would be a holy grail if we really have all this data in the world to be able to tell you that, you know, that's the red line of workload. But we are starting to kind of, uh, we were starting to kind of notice that anything above summer 50 in radiation oncology settings during planning processes is starting to indicate more likelihood of making an error. So we started to use this tool kind of more practically, you know, to drive some other practical work in, in the clinic. Again, so from research, from laboratory studies to some understanding of utilization of the tool for practical work. So that helped us, you know, with a lot of other projects to kind of uh, really drive this. Um, so we were asked because of this work, we were asked to move this work and look at the bigger aspect of electronic health records, right? We know that the usability of the electronic records, uh, uh, EHRs 
it was uh, it's still a suboptimal, definitely over the last decade, you know, a lot of issues. Uh, so we were asked to perform a study where we would take two uh, EHRs, our last, you know, our in-house, which was called WebSys, we had actually in-house system, and then Epic was coming, um, you know, to our, to, to our hospital. So we started running uh, simulated experiments, trying to understand, you know, how, how residents, uh, in this case, would perform on, on this type of studies. So we designed three uh, different uh, scenarios. One was uh, kind of urinary, urinary tract infection. We have uh, pneumonia and heart failure. And they were progressively more difficult. And when I say more difficult, I want you guys to kind of see, we did this with the concept of task demand. We didn't know what the workload will be exactly. We could project and using other tools, um, knowing that we want to vary. You know, the variable that we are interested in is to say, hey, can we, can we put people under a specific task demand and the way we quantify task demand, we understood exactly the number of screens, the number of information, number of clicks, all the things we were able to, to quantify to understand what it takes as a task demand that's gonna impose the workload on the person. We vary that, that you know, that was the variable that we were varying in this experiment. And we wanted to study, you know, the, per, the perceived and objective workload and then performance. So we done, done this, you can see the steps on this, uh, this this was a co-design with our with our residents, and I want to show you that. Uh, really interestingly speaking, you know, as as you can see this graph again on the on the y-axis you have a severity of errors, and you have on the x-axis you're looking at the workload, which is NASA TLX in this case. And now you have on this on the right-hand side of each graph you see that task demand where we split the cases after we've learned, you know, we've kind of studied this. We put them in a bundle of high versus low because in the actual performance of the tasks the two of our scenarios you know there were no significant di difference in terms of what these clicks were what the number of visit screens were uh, we were predicting that people would do different processes by the gold standard but the way they interacted was different so we we bundled this into two groups kind of the low and high which the uti case was really simple and you can see now kind of how we how this how this relationship between the workload task demand and severity of errors, which is in this case performance, that we started to see that there are shaping to, uh, to see, right? And in this case, uh, it was obvious that, you know, the more of this usability, you're right, the, the more clicks, the more un, unuseful clicks, the more of these visits and, and more complexities, people we've seen increased number of errors and the severity of the errors were increasing with these, with these cases. So this become a real, we've published this in a number of journals, as you can see here. Um, uh, and then we moved to this uh, important topic. We get a HRQ decided to fund our work and apply all these concepts that we've been developing in, uh, in these studies uh, to the problem of abnormal test results and the follow-up. We know that that's a big, big, uh, big deal. Uh, that was, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, have an abnormal test result and uh, we don't follow up and they, that turns to develop, you know, some really consequences down the road for them. So really big issue. Um, so in this case, uh, the way we designed this experiment, uh, you know, uh, to, to run this, we, um, we approach this that we're going to take uh, an average set of results that people, that, that our attendings, our faculty, right, the physicians, would look at one time in the what's called epic in basket, right? So this is almost like think about looking at your email and they're gonna see 35 different results in that screen that has a you know, very, very specific usability. Um, and we, again, we went into the low versus high. We kept the number of results the same, but we, we actually gave them different uh, task demand by saying here, you're gonna have eight abnormal results versus 16 abnormal results that you need to, find and you need to react on, right? And as you can see in this, the way we've done it also that your first visit to our lab was under this condition where in a second visit, now you're acting upon what you've prescribed because there were abnormal test results. Now you need to make a follow-up, right? So we actually uh, 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 built in that certain patients missed. They, we've, we've scheduled and there was a no-show, meaning that when they came back to the lab, the epic, you know, the system would have to in indicate to them 
that uh, this patient missed it. And again, as you can imagine, the usability is not the best of these screens. So we were curious if our physicians are going to actually uh, see these uh, no-shows and they're going to do something about it, right? In that sense, because that's where a lot of problems happen. If there is no show, we still have time to react if we, uh, if we, if we see this. So, uh, so we published this work in 2019 in... Um, in JAMA, and this received a lot of um, it a lot of attention. This article received uh, quite a bit of attention, you know, through through different communities. Um, but you can see here that uh, we did find uh, that, you know, you know. Let me kind of walk this through. First of all, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, maybe from from that bottom. I want to point to you guys to this one result. Um, if you look at the overall performance code, which is at the bottom of the, of the table there, the way it's presented in this table is the number of appropriately managed, right? Appropriately managed of these results. Uh, and the denominator is the number of failure opportunities, right? There's a lot of failures that could have been if you're doing everything wrong. Um, so you can see that uh, in the baseline, in a baseline EHR, which was the experiment we, which we run versus where we've enhanced the usability, where we actually have taken, and you know, it wasn't a, a great study of how we, it was a very brute force usability improvement in, in that sense, just for this experiment sake to say, if we make even basic changes to the EHR, you know, can we really see a performance changes uh, with respect to, right, well, how they do on these results with performance and so on. So you can see that the results go from 68% of of properly managed results with the basic changes to usability, we were able to get it to 89. So there was a statistical difference. It was not perfect because again, it did not go through a, you know, kind of a full usability evaluation. It was really brute force, but that was a, was really interesting result. And, um, but what you, what you can probably note is that we went from 98 of new abnormal test results being, being actually recognized to a hundred percent. And I think that for me, at least, you know, for me, that was a, I was really glad to see that even those basic things, we got a system again, thinking about reliability. We got it in this simulated lab to a hundred percent that everybody was able to at least, you know, spot the new abnormal test result. And if you can see on the follow-up and the no-shows, we went from 37% only which is, you know, people were missing, they didn't know where to go, how to look at it. It was not clear, it didn't stand out. And even with the basic changes, we got it to 77%. And we know we can do better with more of the, of the technological change. Please know that working in Epic Playground and making usability changes is not easy, right? So despite of all the efforts that we would like to implement, we were not able to implement technically uh, the, the usability change we want. So we had to make this experiment uh, you know, we were limited by the capabilities of the Epic Playground in our institution here. So uh, important work, as you can see also that mental demand was the only uh, fact, you know, the only element of NASA TLX that um, we kind of saw this uh, statistical difference. And we also had some interesting um, look from the blink rate. So we kind of analyzed variety of different measures. And we found that during this interaction, one of the um, kind of, you know, uh, uh, measures of potentially of cognitive workload if, if you if you look at a blink rate that there was a, a significant change between blinks uh, in this in this case and uh, and as you can see people that if you're paying attention i think during the uh, human computer interaction in this case what we noted that uh, people actually blinked more even more relaxed when the usability was more impressed so again that is a little bit of a soft finding uh, but we did report that as a, something interesting we spotted um, in this in this paper um, okay, so uh, I mean, look at my time, 3.30. Okay, so uh, the next set of, of work is uh, in, a, we, in radiation oncology, we get another funding from, from ARC. And in this case, we wanted to go in and do a little bit more a randomized studies uh, where we would test if people that actually go come to the laboratory and receive training uh, in the laboratory settings about the potential dangers of the of the usability of the technology working and better understand the interactions and we provide them with the proper training to make them aware of these uh, and then we also would expose them to the next randomization to a uh, enhanced environment in radiation oncology of improved checklist improved usability so you can see you have four groups right so kind of a, a you know two by two design here 
And we wanted to understand, you know, what is that workload? What is the performance we're going to see if we go through this experiment in a, in a you know, in a simulated uh, fashion again? Um, so the way we've uh, we've designed it, uh, we had two scenarios again. Um, what you see on the slide is relatively, uh, you know, more what I would say more straightforward uh, case where you see the meds in the brain. Um, those are those uh, those kind of a uh, light bluish uh, turquoise color. So you know any any physician or resident seeing that you know would have to put uh, the field to make sure that you know you cover with your field that you're going to radiate all these targets. But at the same time, you should recognize that there are some healthy uh, uh, organs, right? That you have to avoid. You know, in this case, the cord and the eye. So in this, uh, what we were expecting people to recognize this and draw the proper field, but you can see the variability in performance between these subjects, you know, marked here from, you know, B to I, and there's a little bit of a score. 100 is the perfect score. If you did everything correctly and you took in, every, into consideration all these components, you would score 100. But you see these scores kind of vary, you know, from 55, you know, in some case where someone is not really thinking, maybe rushing, maybe oversimplifying, say, this is just a simple brain. I just got to do my standard, you know, and I'm forgetting to look at the prior radiation that this patient was radiated previously for head and neck. And I should have looked at the records and I cannot put more radiation into their neck because that's that's overdose, you know, in this case. So we were looking of how this, you know, in this simulated environment, how people would interact with the system, what information they're gonna extract, what they're gonna design. So this was considered the easier case versus here, what you have on this slide, it's a very complex case um, where you need to take into consider a lot of information um, and again, you have a, a kidney, which is the target, and you need to provide 50 grade to that kidney, but you have to, you know, spare the other one. You have the kind of the bowel, which you have to also be very considerable about not over overdosing. You have a cord, and there are some limitations of how much dose these organs can receive. Uh, so this was a beam design, right? You have to actually think about creatively about in this plan, how you're going to position your beams to actually accomplish all these complexities of this patient who had the prior, you know, prior cancer, prior radiation, and we got to do this work. Um, as you can probably quickly see out the scores and kind of the designs of the beams that you have a lot of variability, how people thought about it. And really, um, you know, if you think about it, there was, uh, because it was a quite, quite outside the box, a little bit of thinking, that the subject F, you know, scores 95. And you can see this person actually decides to underdose the target. However, to ensure that all, all their healthy organs are gonna be receiving the proper dose. Um, there was a way to receive a hundred on this test, but you know, nobody actually from this, from this group that we worked uh, were able to come, come up with these ideas. So, so we ran these two scenarios and we, and we, um, we also, you know, what I wanna show, we also, when we were running this, think about now this set of people that are coming, they're doing this pre-training and pre-enhancement, right? So we did the pre-test. Everybody comes to the lab, does these tests. Now we're going to you know, randomize them to training and to enhancements. And the training was really sitting down with them. We have a paper written about it as well, where we can describe our procedure of how we approach the training, what were the components, how we talk to people about workload performance to ensure that they can understand you know, the human factors behind that interaction. So it was really fun kind of spending time with, uh, with these physicians in the lab and, and teaching them about these concepts and walking them through and watching their eye tracking on the videos and showing them what they did and what they didn't do. There was a lot of fun. Um, so they received the training and some of them will receive the enhancements. And I wanna show you just kind of uh, this video because, you know, it is difficult to scan through all these plans. So one of the enhancements, hopefully this will play, um, is, is to think about how do you remove you know, these, these demands from people, right? So this is how the, during the current function, this is how people have to look at it. You know, there's a cord and there's a prior radiation. I need to scan through these slides, figure it out on these scan images that someone had it. And now as I'm providing this, you know, this brain meds, I have to take into consideration that previously the radiation was in the cord. So I have to look at it, right? That's that's a lot of work, actually. You have to open the images. You got to scroll. You got to look at them properly. So what if, right, we give them an automated way of, of quickly, at least, giving a first glance at what this is, right? So we wrote this, uh, you know, to, with work with the computer science. As you can see now, you know, they can one-click solution. All right, there's red. There's an overlap. 
uh, from the prior radiation. This is how it looks on the cord. There it is where you're providing a, you know, that overlap. So we, we calculate it for you. We are showing it to you for your consideration. This might be unsafe. The way also design is properly, you put it too close to the eye. There are red marks on the eye, meaning that some radiation right now is going to the eye. Uh, and that's how it looks. I always love that is because it looks like these Lego heads, you know, um, on this on this picture. So I always uh, kind of uh, have a, I'm entertained by this, this how this looks. Uh, but as you guys can imagine, this is an example of, a, of you know, how can I reduce the task demand and hopefully, you know, that that workload of the work and help people do better move forward. So again, we have a lot of enhancements that we build um, to see how this would uh, work. Um, this is just another another one just to kind of show you guys. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, this is a picture of alignment, right? If you take two scans and you put them together and you're trying to understand uh, what's happening, if you can position the, 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 the patient properly on the table and kind of look at the, you know, what has happened previously on the overlap. So uh, it is not easy. And again, you know, this is a, a easier way of color coding and potentially highlighting the differences in in alignment, right? On the, that, that you have to, when you, when you, when you fuse these plants together, uh, you can start seeing that the autonomy and the, the, the human body is, was different. So here's a picture of all the significant uh, ways of misalignment. You're probably asking yourself, okay, the hip is different. That might be okay because, you know, patients have changed. They lost the weight. They're just different, you know, human beings after, you know, going through a therapy now and before. But you also would spot that, you know, the ribs, the breathing, okay, that's fine, maybe, right? And you know, the breeds, and they were in, taking pictures in the different locations. The, the cord, in the, the spinal cord, you can see that there is a, you know, the, uh, there's some misalignment, but the hands. Like one thing that we were really hoping that people will pick up is to say, well, the last picture was taken with hands up. And in this one we had, so all, but nobody was thinking about it in this experiment. We were really curious. We kind of did it on purpose. If people are gonna comment why the hands are up and down, right? Nobody was really thinking about it that there was potentially the misalignment now that, you know, years ago we came to this patient and we asked him to take all the images with hands up. And now we ask him with hands down. And that might be also a problem when we fuse this, right? So that be, could be indicative of, do we need to rescan with the hands up so that the alignment is better and we can have better calculations. Uh, on the on the dose, so um, a lot of creative work like this, in which uh, you know I'm kind of zipping through this, but I want to show you that uh, when I looked at the training, when I just looked at that randomization to the training, people performed after training when we kind of did you know post, and this is you know pre there's a training, there was a time period you know of a of a year after so we pre assessment there was a training done, and a year later we're doing the training uh, post assessment. I'm sorry. And you can see that the group that went to the, simu to the, to the simulation-based training in our lab performs you know, significantly better than the group that uh, was a control group in this case. Uh, not perfect. You know, they didn't perform according to our gold standard you know, as, as, as we hoped, but there was a, a, a big, big improvement in, uh, in, that, in, that, in that group. Um, and then if you look at the time, time to complete, I thought that was really interesting that this group took longer, right? So you're asking, so well, did they become less, you know, less uh, efficient in their work? But you know, in a kind of a exit interviews and kind of re-watching the tape and studying what they've done, uh, what we've noticed is that they just literally took extra time to ensure um, that things are done correctly, right? They double check, they cross check, they they took extra time to ensure that they do better. So you know, that was a significant amount of time, as you can see. You know, from about 40 to over 50 minutes. So that is a, a you know extra, you know, 12, 13 minutes that they took to complete the same plan. So uh, really fascinating work, um, you know, on this on this on this end. And I um, I want to show you that, you know, during that during all this enhancement, uh, this is a this is how a checklist looks, checklist looks like for for the for physicists for our dosimetrists, right? There are hundreds of items that they need to check. Uh, so we've been engaging with Kartik, uh, my PhD student, on a lot of work, um, understanding the exact interactions of our of our planners with these checklists when they need to take into account, um, you know, prescription, patient information, um, and the whole process of the interaction, you know, pre-planning, during planning post-planning. I mean, the, the phases of the interactions are very complex. And I'm showing this on the screen because this is our, our 
newest design. I know it doesn't look, you know, for the probably the first look looks really com, you know, co complex, uh, and it is. But I want to pinpoint you to a couple things. Um, uh, what we've learned, and this is and before I even say this, what I want to, what I want to kind of give credit again to Elizabeth and and Andre, because this time for this experiment, we've used the multi-method, multi-phased uh, approach. You know, this is our first study. It's been going for over two years. And because of your work and inspiring us to really not take it for granted and do just some kind of a, what I would say, you know, usability testing that, you know, maybe quick, you know, but not enough evidence or, you know, maybe very heavy, but take too much time. Finding that middle ground of, and filling that gap, I think that we still have as a researchers, right? We kind of operate in the spectrum of we've going really too heavy or too little. I, I feel like there's some opportunities to really uh, contribute here to the methodologically to this uh, to this work. But we've taken this and through very careful assessments of usability tools and uh, and workload tools and performance, um, which you, as you know, there's a lot of a lot of possible possible ways of measuring these. We've decided of how we're gonna do it in, you know, in a current state, and how we're gonna work through this through all the all the phases of the usability, uh, including the, the simulated environment, you know, preclinic, near life testing, and then actually going into the real world, but still in the concept of the of the testing in the clinical environment before we actually would initiate, you know, kind of the full implementation. Um, so you can see we use things like uh, SU keys, you know, for right after the task. We had turf model helping us guide us at the very stage here. We have the multi-phase uh, approach uh, as, as described. Um, and this gave us a tremendous amount of, of leverage working with our people and really showing them uh, the, the, um, the, their work, right? And really involving them in a co-design and co-involvement where the scores of the of our tools becomes a partner in a design process. Uh, think about it that every score you take and all those measurements that we like to quantify to guide our design, they become a partner in the design process itself. So we're gonna definitely write a paper about the reflections we've had about just that concept and really talking about how the evolution of errors and learning that we've had of designing, as I mentioned, these complex tools and how we are getting people to agree of the of what this is and how it looks and how it works and all the functionalities to be able to really uh, uh, you know move the department and actually in a in a with a specific rigor right and actually see this change so a couple really great uh, wins for us first of all all our dosimetries and physics we're talking about 15 people in the department they all did it differently at the beginning of this process. We are ending two years of work. And I know very slow, you might, you might think, but we are learning. Um, we are having all 15 people now in agreement on an electronic checklist, which I think is by itself that these 15 people are able to come together and agree and actually believe that this is the tool that's gonna make them better and protect them, you know, make them safer as, as, as a professionals and save our, and also save our uh, patients. I, I'm, I paused for a second. I saw my video post. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, this in, in that sense, uh, it, 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 uh, the results, you know, which, which I am offering that we are happy to come back and show you the results of this study itself. That would be probably a separate talk. And uh, I definitely would like my PhD student, Kartika Dapa, to join uh, because, you know, that's, you know, the credit goes to him for doing this work but also learning the evolution of finding errors during this process and how, you know, how it really exponentially grew in number of, of changes and errors we've seen in the simulated as we are getting closer to the near life testing and kind of the clinical testing. So there's a really nice uh, way of quantification as we've noticed about how much benefit we get from you know the functional addition, the usability additions, and then from the error detection uh, through the process, and I think that's important work. If we could bundle more studies and can actually understand you know how each phase of this process works and what we are contributing, I think there's still um, there's still opportunities in that space for for all of us to come together and 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 work. Um, 
All right, so my I'm gonna take just just last few minutes. I do want to cover a little bit of a work from the uh, UNC Health, and I definitely will leave enough time for for questions. Uh, but I do want to share with you that we have taken the spirit from radiation oncology, as I mentioned, about what we've been working, and our healthcare system asks us to implement a new usability, a new interfaces, and a new system for error reporting. Um, the project was initiated about four years ago, so about you know you can see this timeline of 43 months here, um, and we as an institution were about 700 reports per month, right uh, across you know our medical center, which is uh, which is here in Chapel Hill, um, and uh, you can see that with improvements, usability, functionality improvement, we jumped and we were able to make a significant jump to about 1,500. Uh, submissions and again making it easier simpler better for people right more enjoyable in a in a sense of how to do it thinking about a system as this is things that carry home with them right this is a very much a contextual design problem where we have to think about the usability that it starts with you when you wake up in the morning and you drive your bus and you go through the hallway to your workplace this is not just being at the, your unit reporting errors. We got to take it much more globally and in an experienced way when you think about this design. Um, and then really kind of looking also, you know, COVID gave us a dip, as you can imagine, things were really hard at that time. But we also implemented from high reliability uh, as, the, as COVID hit, we realized that we need to do huddles. We need to have a communication structure in the hospital. So my team was asked to develop that initiative. And I want to talk about it a little bit because I think it's so relevant to everything we do that our work on usability, human factors, if it's not integrated with the larger picture of how we work as a system, right? What, what is the work system? Sometimes it's, it's, we are not getting the significant benefits to our patients and to our employees as much as we can. So we designed a system where it's a tier huddles, meaning that every day in every single area of this, of this hospital, and there's 236 areas that we needed to work with, they would meet in the morning and using a, a simple procedure, they would ask, be able to talk through how was last 24 hours? Do we have any issues, any errors, anything to report? Do we have any equipment problems, anything else? And be able to solve it at the moment or assign tasks to people that had on tier one or escalate to their managers and directors, right? And that's the process. And that would come in and then the managers and directors would try to be responsive. They would do this, um, do this type of work. And if they couldn't, uh, so that they would actually, for situation awareness, every day, Monday to Friday, um, would come into tier three at 10 o'clock to meet with our executive leaders. And they can bring any issue from, you know, usability of, of technologies, of Epic, from workflow, from equipment, from cleaning, from trash, anything. Really, well-being was part of that. Um, so, you know, we created this really an acronym that uh, we, and we hang these posters all over the hospital and we train people of how to conduct these huddles. Uh, you can see those those are the elements of the discussion we inspire to do uh, you know important at the bottom is this plus sign wellness for everybody we we train people how to have a daily conversation on wellness uh, and uh, an example of this was um, also give them some tools like a, a daily calendar that would tell you what to do for wellness each day so for example you would come up to a unit and you know today say call your mother tell tell your mom you love her right just call it. That was a suggestion that, you know, for wellness, it would make you feel better. It would make your mom feel better. Uh, so every day there was a, some sort of an offering to, to do something for, for, these, for these folks. Uh, there was a lot of training. So I'm not going to go to this slide, but the, yeah, training had to be created, slides and materials and all these things. Um, but I want to pinpoint that the results were fascinating as we jumped from 1,500 to almost 3,000 reports per month. And we engaged a lot of units. And you can see on this slide, I'm pinpointing a few numbers, but a lot of escalations. People do have issues that want to bring up. You know, there's almost a thousand escalations, as you can see. And more importantly, the leaders that were asked to not have any meetings 30 minutes after the call, right? But have a phone ready and, and say, can you help resolve and spearhead change what we call the close, meaning that something was put in place, some countermeasure. I, I'm not claiming that we solve problems at the root cause. That's not the case. But we are addressing them at 95% that something happens, some response happens, some feedback happens, uh, telling people that what can be done. And people are bringing good catches, sharing stories that something almost happened. It was a good catch, but a little scary. 
Those things are being reported to the tier three. I know a lot of numbers that I'm not going through. We are measuring this, as you can see, there was a huge spike at the beginning, that middle grab there, you can see. And then, you know, things kind of like stabilize. I think we know what to expect now in terms of the monthly submissions to this tier three huddle and which departments are, you know, are submitting at what rate and how engaged they are. And we try to help them as we, as we go forward. Um, all right, so I am going to stop here. I think I'm going to stop here because we have about nine minutes and I want to make sure you guys can ask me any questions. So I thank you for your attention. I know there's a lot of information very fast, but I hope it was uh, somehow was somewhat entertaining, I hope. Lucas, that was awesome. I really enjoyed uh, that talk. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, I, I, I have many questions, but, um, but I, I think what I might do is initially just hold off for my own because I'll have a chance to do them also later on. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Start off here. Oh, <laughs> oh, there's Andre. Yeah, I, I was just great talk. Um, can we comment on this? Probably a long story, but the whole way you integrate.